Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko. We're a new podcast. If you find value from our show, please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast on Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes can be found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, as well as on YouTube. In today's interview, we talk about how Jacques started a company in a field he had no experience in, identifying market opportunities, and how he learned from the creator of LexisNexis. Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Today we have on the show Jacques Voorhees. Jacques was the founder of Brand Matrix, Tradelock, Polygon, and Verichannel. Jacques, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. The largest bulk of time is Polygon, as we were just talking. Uh, that was founded in 1975, and you were at the helm or, or running it until November 2008. Could you tell us uh, a little bit more about your, your bio? Let me first say what Polygon is. Um, Polygon, and this sounds a bit absurd for 1975, but Polygon was uh, the attempt to move the business-to-business -business diamond market online. Um, now, moving markets online in the, you know, today, that's like, well, duh, that's what you know everyone's doing and all the markets have gone online. But the idea of computerizing the diamond industry in 1975, when you know, we're, we're significantly before the creation of personal computers, um, we're, we're almost two decades before the creation of the World Wide Web. Um, it was an absolutely insane thing to even to even think about, let alone try to do. But that's what Polygon, uh, that was the seeds of Polygon, was the idea of moving the, computer, the diamond industry online to computerize it and to generate efficiency uh, in the buying and selling of diamonds by, by doing that. Okay, so, so given that that's what Polygon was, a person might look to my bio or my background and, and assume I had some business knowledge of, of diamonds or of computers or at least of starting new companies, or maybe I was a financial whiz, or, or maybe I was just out of college with a newly minted MBA, or something like that. But the truth is, despite how crazy the idea was to computerize the diamond industry in 1975, there could have been nobody less qualified to take on that impossible <laughs> challenge. I had no background or knowledge of diamonds. I had no background or knowledge of computers or computer science. I had a, a poli sci degree, which has to be one of the most useless pieces of paper on the planet. Um, I had no background or knowledge uh, of business um, or finance. I had no money behind me. I had absolutely nothing. Um, and it, it was somehow absurd that I would even try to do this. Um, what, what so did you see? What, what did you see in the diamond industry that led you to believe that computerizing it would be beneficial? Right. Well, when no one uh, else saw this. Yeah. <laughs> good. Good question. It's worth spending a couple minutes just on how how such an unlikely person fell down this rabbit hole <laughs> and ended up trying to, to climb sort of back out of it, if you will. Um, I was I was um, between jobs. I'd, I'd had I'd worked for a, a U.S. Senate a campaign shortly after college. And we'd lost. Um, and so we were all all the staffers were looking for work. And a, and a friend of my father's had just gotten into this new thing called uh, selling diamonds to investors. And he wasn't a diamond guy either. He was in Iowa. But but in the in the mid to late 70s, when inflation was so high, everyone was jumping into hard assets and mm -hmm. the diamond industry was responding to that. And a whole new ecosystem had come into existence, which was diamonds for investment. And it grew quickly to something like a $20 billion a year industry, which is about the size of the whole jewelry market for diamonds. And it was a completely new phenomenon and all kinds of new people were jumping into it. And so uh, this guy in Iowa offered me a position, you know, like as a salesperson or something, we weren't quite sure, but, but he offered to have me get involved in, in the diamond business, even though he didn't know much about it himself. And so I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Um, I, I think I should learn something about this industry before I jump into it. So I went on my own nickel, I went to New York City and took um, uh, the, a one-week diamond grading course from the Gemological Institute of America, which is kind of the, the, the Harvard MBA organization, if you will, and, and learned a lot about how to grade diamonds for what that's worth in, in one week. And um, the, the other kids in the class were sort of sons and daughters of top New York diamond dealers that had been sent to this class just so they would have a little bit of professional knowledge. 
And one of them, his father, was the head of the of the New York Diamond Dealers Club at the time, William Goldberg. And this this kid, I can't remember his own name, but he asked me to meet his father, and because I I wanted to get his father's input on what I was doing and the whole diamond investment thing. Anyway, William Goldberg, and now 47th Street in New York is named William Goldberg Way. This guy sort of became the the patriarch of the New York diamond industry. But this was many years ago, and. He told me that diamonds were a lousy investment and I shouldn't get into this business. And I said, well, why are they a lousy investment? And he said, because you can buy them, but you can't sell them. It's not like the gold market where you can buy and sell easily in and out. Um, you can buy them and you're paying retail price and you're selling them and you're paying something lower than wholesale price. And, and you, you just lost 50 percent of the value by, by trying to get in and out of the market. That's why they're a bad investment. And and I said, well, why shouldn't there shouldn't does it really have to be that inefficient? And he said, well, that's just the way it is. If there were a market for diamonds like there is for gold or other things, then it might make sense. But there isn't one. So you shouldn't take that job. You should get out of this business. <laughs> so as I was driving back home from New York, it kind of struck me that if there's twenty six billion dollars of, of, of money going into diamonds as an investment each year, and there is no liquid marketplace for these investors, then by God, someone needs to create one. And, and that was the light bulb moment from which I decided to create Polygon. And I mean, that's that's all I knew about the whole thing was just kind of what Goldberg had said and, and my decision to fix a problem that obviously existed. And I, I reasoned that the only way you could have a, a efficient liquid market in diamonds is if you somehow use computer technology and built it somewhere uh, around kind of how the commodity exchanges work and NASDAQ and all that kind of stuff. So throw computers at it and you could probably come up with a with a liquid market for diamonds. Bingo. That was the that was the idea. And that's how I got into this thing. Fascinating for myself and our users that don't have much familiarity around the diamond industry. If someone was to invest in a diamond in 1975, would that have worked out for them if they were still holding that diamond today? It would depend which diamond you bought. And the common wisdom back then, which was incredibly incorrect, was that if you're buying a diamond for investment, you should buy the highest quality diamond, which is stupid. That's like saying if you're going to invest in real estate, <clears throat> you have to buy the most expensive real estate. You have to buy downtown Manhattan real estate or downtown Hong Kong real estate. It's, it's insane to think that just because it's the most expensive, uh, it will be the best investment. And so, But because that was the common wisdom, everyone started buying these one carat D flawless diamonds, which is the highest quality in a one carat. So you can imagine what happened to the price of the one carat D flawless. It shot up from about $10,000 a carat to $60,000 in about 12 months. Wow. And then when finally the diamond investment market crashed, which it did um, right around 1980, um, when that happened, the or around 81 maybe, um, <laughs> the price of that one carat that everyone had been investing in dropped to about $6,000. It, it wiped out 90% of its value. Wow. So the people wow. that invested in that, but the people that invested in more typical jewelry grade diamonds um, ended up, uh, would have done quite well and uh, and even more so today. Uh, although in the last year, the diamond market's fallen. But, but in general, it was one of those classic herd instincts of investors going in exactly the wrong direction and, and many people got burned. <laughs> this tends to happen. It tends to happen. Absolutely. Jacques, so you've been around your own company and entrepreneurship in general for quite a long time. What characteristics do you see that make up a successful entrepreneur? Of course, there's there's the obvious ones, you know, like hard work and wanting to be your own boss and, and you know, that kind of thing. And people have talked about that all the time. I, I think there are two things that are not talked about enough and that I see as, as very important characteristics. And one of those is interpersonal skills. Uh, an entrepreneur has to be able to get along with everybody. And, you know, from the supplier to the computer nerd, to the, to the customer, to the other employees, to the, you're just, you're, at least this was my experience. I had to deal with s such an, a varied type of, and still do, and it, I'm still involved in the diamond industry dealing with different cultures, you know, India, China, the Jewish culture in New York. Um, and here I am just a kid out of Iowa. So I had to I, I had to hone my interpersonal skills quite a bit to be able to, let's say, work with and get along with and cooperate with these different kinds of people I, I had to meet. So that's one of them. Uh, the second one is, I think, if I were to say, what is the other than the obvious stuff like perseverance and hard work, but but the most a unique characteristic that I think an entrepreneur needs to have is nimbleness. 
the ability to realize when something you're doing is not working and and the fact that you have to change it. And because the early entrepreneurs, I mean, the people that are in the early stages of their game, it's constantly changing. And and every business plan, you know what they what they say about uh, battle. I think it was uh, the art of war guy. No, no plan of battle has ever survived the first five minutes of the battle. <laughs> and I think that's true of starting a new business. You know, no business plan has ever survived the first, you know, pick a number five months of of actually trying to go out there and do it. And and that's OK. Um, it's not. It, it, you cannot predict a business plan in today's world. Things are changing too quickly. But what you can do is be nimble. And and when you go and try A and it doesn't work and you try B and B doesn't work and you try C and C starts to show some promise, you know, and, and then being willing to just give up on A and B and jump into C, that's what the entrepreneur has to do. And boy, did we do that at Polygon. We had major tectonic shifts in the in the early days and years. We we I don't can't even imagine how many, I don't mean just tweaking little spreadsheets. I'm talking about complete changes to revenue models and and just just the, the the nature of the market we were going after and all those kinds of things. We had to well, a best example is what happened when the diamond investment market crashed, because in the beginning, Polygon was designed to do just what I wanted it to do, was to be a, a essentially an investment marketplace. Well, all the companies that had been created to cater to the diamond investment market, when that market crashed, they all went out of business, except for one. And that one was Polygon. Why didn't we go out of business? Because we were nimble and we we decided, OK, well, this thing we've spent years trying to to launch into the diamond investment market, that market no longer exists. Darn. Well, let's retool it a little bit and go after the regular mainstream jewelry industry, the business to business aspect of the jewelry industry. And we found that the technologies we developed were a pretty darn good fit. In fact, perhaps even a better fit for the jewelry industry than they were for the diamond investment market, which, by the way, no longer existed. So that's an example of, of the kind of massive nimbleness you have to be willing to to, to um, engage in when you're an entrepreneur. Back to the interpersonal skills. How does one curate those? So let's say, you know, I'm <clears throat> starting as an entrepreneur and I don't you know, really know how to get along with people very well or that, that's a skill that I'd like to improve. How, how does one go from being mediocre at that to excelling to become that successful entrepreneur? <laughs> well, well, now you're asking me questions of psychology and, and all kinds of things like that. And there's been lots of books written about that. The, the, the classic one written years ago was Dale Carnegie's book, um, How to How to Win Friends and Influence People. Great book. It's a great book. And everyone I've known that's read it says it changed their life. And I would say it, it changed my life. Same. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's one of those, you know, if there were 10 books you, you should have to read in life, that should be among the 10 and probably number one uh, on the list. Yeah. Just because yeah. if you don't know how to get along with people, everything else you're going to screw up at and and vice versa. So that's that's certainly one part of it. But. Um, another thing, if you want, if you want practice, and this may sound kind of crazy, uh, go on to social media, go on to Facebook and get involved in some of the threads where people are, are like debating politics and, and see and, and try to, to engage the people that are there fighting and yelling and screaming at each other in a way where none of them are screaming and yelling at you, where you're actually participating in the conversation, but you're doing it in a way that, that is respectful that is not sarcastic, that is uh, sort of validating everyone else's position and building on that. And if you can get good at that, <laughs> imagine bringing that skill to a boardroom where, where you have different, you know, different interests being represented. And, and it's in some ways the same kind of skill. You, you never want to tell someone their idea is stupid. Uh, you, you always need to be in kind of this brainstorming mentality of, of inviting new ideas and, and validating people's opinions and pointing out cautiously some issues that might be involved, but let's talk it through. You just you need to develop that spirit of of every conversation being a productive, positive one, rather than oh that's a stupid idea. No, we tried that before; it's not going to work. No, you know, you know, you, it's a difference between being positive and being negative, and you can really practice that on social media. So you would recommend bringing pictures of cute kittens into the boardroom as a way to become more successful. Well, it would be a way to lighten the meeting, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any, when any, things get too tense. Anytime you can get people smiling rather than frowning, that's a good thing. Right. And if that means a picture of a cute kitten to start off a board meeting, you know, sure, why not? <laughs> um, just lighten it up. And, and, you know, I always, 
One thing I will say, in all the companies I've been involved with, we never had a non-unanimous board vote. We sometimes had abst people abstaining uh, for, for various conflict of interest reasons, but but we never had a non-unanimous or, or, or let's say a, a divided vote because everything I tried to do was constantly win-win. If if we were trying to do X, but X would hurt one board member and not hurt another, then then we hadn't gotten there yet. We needed to keep talking it through until the plan we came up with was always good for everybody. Mm. And you know, I, I'm willing to say that's probably not mathematically always possible. But in my experience, we never had a non-unanimous vote. And, and that's kind of I think a lot of that comes back to just getting along with people and, and making sure that everything you do is a win win for all the stakeholders. That's a pretty amazing track record. It, it is when I think about it. Yeah, I don't, don't, don't I mean, I'm still involved with boards. I don't know if it'll continue. But but so far, I'm I'm like 237 to zero or whatever the <laughs> number would be. What mistakes have you made that our listeners can learn from? So it sounds like you've got the boardroom wrapped up, but were there other areas where you made a mistake and can can share the experience with us? Yeah, ironically, it comes back to this thing I mentioned about nimbleness. I developed this opinion about nimbleness by making the mistakes of not being nimble enough <laughs> and, and not being quick enough. Um, I mean, we if you want to look, you, you can look at what I built with Polygon against incredible odds and starting from an absolutely impossible position and, and be pretty impressed with it. But you can also look at it and say, why did it take the guy, you know, over 30 years? Well, it took me over 30 years because I, I, I had all these these negatives going into it. I didn't have the experience and the qualifications and all this stuff. Um, but also, I, I in hindsight, I was not nimble enough. And in hindsight, the big, massive changes that we decided to make, and we were making those, you know, <laughs> more than once or twice. We had multiple big, massive strategic changes. I should have made them earlier, and I, I shouldn't have, uh, have beat my head against the wall um, that that long in a in a wrong direction. And of course, that's easy to understand or perceive when you look back on it with hindsight. Yeah, very difficult to realize at the time because. Because the entrepreneur has to balance persistence and stay the course with nimbleness. And, and they're opposite. They really are. Um, and so you, if, if you think you're, you're on to something correct and you've got the right revenue model and, you know, you've got, and, and you're just running into some, some difficulties that you can bash through, yes, then you want to be perseverant and bash through them. But if things just aren't going the right way and, you know, you're just not able to generate revenue and for whatever reason, or you're just, you know, your costs are too high or your market, whatever the obstacles you're encountering, and it just doesn't seem to be getting better, then you have to know when not, not to give up. The entrepreneur should never give up. The entrepreneur should never throw in the towel and say, I give up. I'm going to go just do something else and get a job somewhere and work for somebody else. I mean, no, that's failure. What the entrepreneur should do is say, this isn't working. So what can I do to make it work? How do I change? How do I evolve? How do I how do I be nimble? And and maybe that means shutting down company X and and having company Y rise from its ashes. You know, that that's a that's a, a move movement forward, whatever. But you 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 change direction all the time, whenever you need to, frequently, aggressively. But you just never give up. And, and balancing that between stay the course versus nimble, that's one of the hardest things to get right. And I've gotten it not right many times. <laughs> For people that aren't entrepreneurs today but are considering the jump, so they um, maybe have an idea that they like or they just know that they're not happy as the, you know, the nine to five worker, what mind frame would you recommend? How, how do they go about thinking when's the right time and how to do it? Yeah, I'm not a good person to answer that because I never really was in, in that position. And I've run into many people in the, that are entrepreneurs that were in that classic position. Let's say, you know, they got out of, out of university, maybe they had an MBA degree, they went to work for a big company like IBM or whatever. And here they were doing well and, and having all kinds of, you know, financial success perhaps, but they weren't, they weren't personally fulfilled. They wanted to be their own boss. And so they had to, they had this big fork in the road where they had to make the decision. Do I leave all this? And, and jump into the world of the unknown, or do I not? I never faced that fork in the road because I never, I, I never was in a position where I was doing well, big company, good background, lots of education, climbing a ladder. I, I never was on that ladder. I, I, I was unemployed and had to figure out what to do next. And I decided, hmm, I think I'll try to do this next. Computerize the diamond industry. That sounds like fun. 
And so it, for me, it was always the mindset was always, hey, I have to support myself. And this looks like a fun way to support myself. In hindsight, it might have been crazy. Maybe I would have been much better off going to work for some regular company and climbing a ladder and, and so forth. But I never was on that ladder. I never I never tried to do that. And so my my mindset was always and then, of course, once I got into Polygon and spent years into it, even though we, it took it took many years before we were even profitable. At that point, I couldn't quit um, because then it would look like, well, stupid idiot tried to do this incredible thing with no expertise and being able to do it. And guess what? He failed. What would that look like on a resume? <laughs> so I had I had there was no exit strategy for me. I had to keep going until the thing was successful. And so there was it wasn't so much. Gee, I was so perseverant. It was. I didn't have any other options. And <laughs> when you don't have any other options, it's 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 in some ways easier. And those people that are working for big companies or do have you know, nice degrees from fancy universities and are climbing the ladder or have the potential to climb the ladder, I, I think for them it is much harder. And and I you know, good for them in trying to jump off that that ladder and and jump into the muck of being an entrepreneur. Um, and you know, good on them for being brave enough. I was never brave enough, I just didn't have an, didn't have another choice. Yeah, from uh, some of these, a number of conversations with entrepreneurs, I've, I've heard that echoed of uh, desperation is a, a great motivator when you yeah. have, when, mm -hmm. when success is the only option, you know, yep. there is starvation, you, you tend to figure out a way to make it work. Yep, exactly. It's, uh, yeah, what is that old phrase? Necessity is the mother of invention or something. Yep. Um, if you're desperate, but you're not willing to give up, you know, you, you start, you just, you, the human brain's an amazing thing. It figures out how do I, what do I do? Well, I, I'll do this. And, and if that doesn't work, then you try this. And if that doesn't work, you try this. And eventually something works. Um, but it's pretty scary in the meantime. Bring us forward to today. So um, you've got a project that you've been working on, Vera Channel. Well, Vera Channel is um, it, basically it's like a miniature polygon that does private uh, B2B marketplaces uh, for private groups within the industry. But it's a very small company. It's stable and and it's it's kind of yeah stable is a, is a is a good is a good word for it. Our, our, we have major uh, customers like De Beers. Uh, we operate the trading platform for the Forever Mark Diamond brand, for example. And it's all business to business stuff. Um, so that's that's not where right now I'm putting most of my energy because that's a fairly stable business. I'm putting my energy into this new thing that we've invented that that I tell people I'm now more excited about this business than any business I've ever been involved with, which is true. And it's called the Museum of Named Diamonds. And what we're doing is we're we're doing something that's never been done before. We're we're bringing the concept of named diamonds, which, you know, like the Hope Diamond or the Kohinoor Diamond. We're bringing it down to the retail level where anyone that owns a diamond can officially get that diamond named. And that diamond will be named officially just as much as the Hope Diamond is. Um, we were able to secure designation by the World Federation of Diamond Bourses that we are the custodian of diamond names. We're the official registrar of diamond names. Um, so if you have a diamond or your wife has a diamond, you can, for a small amount of money, name the diamond and put the diamond virtually into the Museum of Named Diamonds, which uh, lives at nameddiamonds.org, by the way, nameddiamonds.org. And um, we have all the famous diamonds in there. We have the Hope and the Kohinoor and the Cullinan. We have all that. And then we have personal diamonds that people have named and added their own story to. So we're really not just collecting names. We're collecting stories about those diamonds. We're personalizing the diamonds. We're making them more than a commodity. We're making them a symbol of a true relationship. Um, and this is something that, that everyone in the diamond industry is excited about because for too long, Diamonds have just been marching down the road towards commoditization and away from being symbols of love. And so we're trying to bring back the emotion, the romance, the, the symbolic nature of diamonds, and if you will, uh, make them less about commodities rather than more about commodities. And it's pretty ironic because <laughs> people blame Polygon as the main force that turned diamonds into commodities. We computerized <laughs> the whole darn industry. And now, <laughs> in a strange way, I'm sort of trying to uncommoditize un uh, un it. So that's uh, that's what we're doing right now, and it's pretty exciting. I actually wanted to go back and and ask you a question that I f forgot to earlier. You were able to successfully sell Polygon. How did you do it? How did you take the business, grow it to success, and find an exit strategy? Well, the exit strategy was always uh, the same, which was to sell the business to somebody. And you know, none of us were in that we're doing it for our health. We all wanted to get rich. I mean, seriously, I started Polygon because I wanted to get rich quickly. I. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the reason I wanted to get rich quickly was so I could move to Summit County, Colorado, because I assumed you couldn't live here unless you were rich. I'm, I'm not kidding. That's what I wanted to do. The, the bad news was it took a lot longer than I expected, 33 years or whatever it was. But the good news is that relatively early on in the process, I was able to move the company to Summit County, Colorado anyway. So I was able to live my dream uh, by being in Summit County, even though uh, it was it was a long, hard slog to get to any kind of success. But the way the buyer finally happened, we didn't go to them. They came to us. I got a phone call one day from a company up in Montreal, a public company called MediaGriff. And they bottom line, they they were they were interested in businesses that were online B2B marketplaces and they were going around acquiring them. It was about a 12 month deal start to finish. But but they bought us and uh, it was it was a great price. It was 43 times earnings, uh, which is not, not bad. And um, so we all kind of lived happily ever after. A number of entrepreneurs are thinking about how they exit, and it, it seems to that dynamic seems to change every couple of years of the, the best way to do that. So, yeah, I'm sure there are many ways to do it. Uh, I, I just had always assumed that the way you do it is that someone comes along and buys your business, and that's eventually how it worked out for us. But there are other ways. So let's move into the lightning round. Can you share a tool, shortcut, or hack that's helped you succeed? I, I will say Facebook. And that may sound crazy, but right now I have something like 2,400 Facebook friends. Probably 95% of them are in the industry, my industry, diamond industry, around the world. And the connections I have made through arguing politics politely and, you know, publishing pictures of cute kittens. And I, I now have connections. I always had good connections, but not compared to what I have today, S- sitting at home, playing on Facebook. Uh, interacting with diamond people all over the world, from Mongolia to Argentina. It's it's amazing for me. And of course, the diamond industry is a lot about who you know, and nothing delivers connections like like Facebook. So that's my tool. Interesting. What's your most influential book, aside from how to win friends and influence people? The, the book, this is an old, a very old one, very dated. It's not one of the current crop at all. It's called Up the Organization. It's kind of a funny name, Up the Organization. And I read it back right in the early days of, of trying to get into Polygon. And it was all about, it sort of exposed my eyes to how a business runs and how it, you know, that you have presidents and you have, and you have vice presidents and you have secretaries. You know, coming from a poli-sci major degree, I didn't know any about that stuff. And that was the first thing that kind of made me quite fascinated with the world of business and how you can, how you can sort of start a business and just you know, take over the world with it. And uh, so I, I would put that one as kind of the inspirational one for me, up the organization. Don't know who wrote it. And we'll, we'll put all this into the, the show link so people can link to it and find the yeah. books and everything. Who's your most influential entrepreneur? Uh, that's easy. It was my mentor in New York. Um, when I first went to New York, uh, his name is Don Wilson. Uh, he's no longer with us. He was the, he's best known as the, uh, the founder of LexisNexis. He's the LexisNexis guy, hmm. and he was um, he had a small consulting company in New York at the time, and I scraped together a little bit of seed money to to hire him uh, to sort of give me some advice. The best use of money I've ever spent. He taught me everything I needed to know to be an entrepreneur, and he kept using Lexis uh, as the as kind of a, a model of of how you do things. And I had you know I know more about Lexis and the founding of Lexis than almost anybody on the planet because I spent years with this guy kind of at his side, learning how you do this kind of stuff, learning how to write a business plan, how to raise money and so forth. And it's ironic that my daughter grew up and became a lawyer and uses LexisNexis all the time and can't believe that I was <laughs> connected with the guy that started it. But Don Wilson was was my inspiration. Absolutely. I'm excited to ask you this question because I think you might have an interesting answer. If you were made king of the world, what law would you enact? I only get one law? Hmm. <laughs> um I mean, we can, we can start with, uh, 10, 10 articles and then yeah, on I, I, it'll probably creep, creep larger I, if I know anything about, uh, kingships. <laughs> exactly. Um, one, one change I would like to see in the world is I would like to massively change the education system such that, um, entrepreneurship and starting a new business and all about how you do that represents about I don't know, 50% of the curriculum, K-12 and in college. I, I just think if, if that became the, the focus, I mean, how much have you used the trigonometry you learned in high school or 
or, or the or the geometry or the biology. I, I I've used none of it. But if if I could have been, uh, I think most people on the planet don't understand how you create a business, and it's tragic because even though it's difficult, it's not that difficult. And and if we had instead of a a, a world of whatever we're up to now, seven billion people going around trying to find jobs with a limited number of jobs, if we had seven billion entrepreneurs going around trying to figure out how to come up with new products and services and how to make more things efficient, what would that do to, to planet Earth? It would completely revolutionize it. And and yet the, the world of the entrepreneur is is just not taught. I mean, it's just it's this mysterious thing. And, and the whole educational system is oriented around, oh, you have to learn all these things so that you can go out and get a job. No, that shouldn't be the focus. The focus should be how to create a viable business. And that's what we should be teaching. And if we and that would be the law I would pass to somehow make that, you know, 50 percent of the curriculum for everything that's taught in the world. For our interests on this show, that's the perfect answer I could ever imagine. <laughs> Very good. Well, Jock, to, to finish up, if you have any asks for our audience, anything you'd like to request of them and then provide any contact info or ways to get in touch with you. Well, yeah, if, if um, to put my selfish hat on, I, I'd like to thank anyone out there who um, uh, is in a relationship where they have a diamond or they're about to give a diamond or their significant other has a diamond. I'd like to, to suggest they, they go to nameddiamonds.org and see what we're doing and see how fun and easy it is to, to name your own diamond and to make it part of the world's uh, collection of named diamonds and make your diamond part of the museum. We're trying. It's a new concept, so I'd, I'd like to get as much uh, response and, and feedback as we can on what people think of this idea. And um, so at, at that website, nameddiamonds.org, uh, of course, is all my contact information and, and places to email us and so forth. But I'd love to get feedback from your audience on what we're doing. Perfect. Well, Jacques, thanks so much. Enjoy the uh, cold Colorado weather, and we hope to have you back soon to talk, talk more about how that project is going. Sounds great. And in the meantime, anyone that wants to find me on Facebook, uh, just under my name, you'll find me. J-A-C-Q-U-E-S, V like Victor, O-O-R-H-E-E-S. Thank you to Jacques Voorhees. This episode was edited by Justin. Thank you for listening to Liberty Entrepreneurs. We'll catch you next time.